All right, um, I just wanna say again, um, hello OWASP community. I wanna start off with saying a big, big, big congratulations to OWASP. 20 years is a huge milestone. I know how much OWASP has changed my life um, for the better. Like a big congratulations to the OWASP team and the OWASP community. So today I just wanna talk a little bit more about how we can change threat modeling. How do we approach it differently in the, these years? Um, we all talk about security should be everyone's responsibility and we should uh, definitely do that, but let's redefine what threat modeling is and let's democratize it. Let's make sure that everyone knows how to do it and it's everyone's actual responsibility. So um, what's the agenda for today? The goal is to talk a little bit more about how we can do self-serve threat modeling and why I think it's the future. So we'll cover a little bit about what threat modeling is so that we can be all on the same page. Then we'll talk about a little bit about self-serve threat modeling and then we'll do a little deep dive into the program that we have set up at my current company and talk about the good and bad things about this sort of program. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a guy that did software development in my career, um, like a really, really, really long time of it. Then uh, I've always been interested in security. And one day a really, really smart security guy told me that I should join his team and become a security engineer. I listened to him, I joined, and then and that was a long time ago. And I've done security for a long time now. And these days I try to help other people to learn about security and get into security, um, which is why I've been super involved with OWASP in the last several years. And in particular, the Vancouver chapter here um, and making sure that we get good speakers that come out and introduce new speakers uh, to OWASP as well. So. One fun fact about me, I'm really good at knowing my family because I like to talk a lot about risk. Having said that, I was definitely not able to predict the yeast shortage at the beginning of the pandemic. I could not have ever envisioned that everyone would go on a bread baking uh, binge. So it was upsetting to me because I wasn't able to make pizza for like a month. But fortunately, now I have been able to mitigate that risk by I have a good supply of yeast and then hopefully it doesn't run out. Okay. So let's talk a little bit uh, about threat modeling. Again, I don't really want to spend too much time about it, but I want to make sure that we're on the same page with respect to threat modeling. Um, what is threat modeling? The goal of threat modeling is pretty straightforward. We want to identify the assets that we have in our system and figure out the risks to those assets. Once we understand the risks, it's really possible for us to think about all the different ways that we can protect our assets. And at the very base of threat modeling, it should be simple, transparent, and we should ensure that everyone has a voice. Everyone's opinion is very different about a particular system and how you can attack it. So making sure that everyone is involved will help make sure that we, have, we build a robust system. Okay, why is threat modeling important? There are many, many different reasons for why it's important. Um, security is embedded right into the design phase. As an industry, we talk a lot about shifting left. We talk about it because the further left you shift security, potentially your system will become much more robust and it can with, withstand a lot of attacks. So threat modeling is very, very far left because we're performing security right in the design phase. This also means you can fix vulnerabilities before they are actually created in the system. So you can, which is amazing, you can fix vulnerabilities before a single line of code has been written. Um, threat modeling is also a great way to discover assets in your system. So when you're architecting a solution or when a developer is architecting a solution, if you know your assets, you will it'll make sure that you think more about the resiliency of those assets. And Or if you have an attacker mindset as a developer, you'll think about the various ways you can cause harm to those assets. So having thought about that while you're in the design phase, um, you'll make sure that you start thinking about ways to make it more resilient. Threat modeling is great to prioritize your mediation efforts. You'll discover problems in your system when you threat model. You just need to figure out what all those problems are, which ones are important, which ones uh, that are less important. So then you can figure out which ones you need to mitigate right away. It's a document of threats, of my mitigations, and assumptions. So for me personally, I love the paper trail of threat models. When I enjoyed my and when I joined my current company, I uh, peeked around, looked at the various threat models that they've done in the past, and it gave me a real good understanding of how uh, this company really thought about threats and how we want to address those threats. And also making sure that we have a document is 
important because threat models do go stale. So if you have a document of all these previous threat models, you can look at them occasionally and make sure that the assumptions that we've made in the past are still valid assumptions. They might not be valid assumptions any longer. Something you consider as a low risk in the past might now be a critical risk now. So having it documented really makes it easier to go back and revisit them. And I love that like, threat models are a great tool for security researcher, especially if you're engaging with them for pen testing. So we've started doing that with some of our threat models and we get to share these documents and I love having a security researcher just go in and we made a bunch of assumptions, have them either prove that the assumptions were correct or that they were wrong. And it, it, makes, it, it makes you know that uh, you're building a proper system. Okay, now that we talked a little bit about what threat modeling is, just to get on the same page, um, let's redefine it. Threat modeling is ridiculously hard. We should think about ways to make it easier and I should note, this is one way to empower your developers to do threat modeling, but there are many, many different flavors of doing it as well. So um, what are some of the problems that we're trying to solve with uh, threat modeling? Uh, threat, threat modeling comes with a ton of its own problems. And there are a few particular problems that we want to solve when we want to redefine our threat modeling program. It's hard to scale. So in many companies, there are very few folks that actually know how to threat model well. And if a company grows and it grows exponentially, um, the issue can get worse. It can get so much so worse that you'll hit number two, whereas developers might get blocked by security. So if you have a SDL, a security development lifecycle, where it requires the development team to threat model every feature, then if you have a larger team, then it makes it really difficult. So if there are only a few folks that can do it well, that means the business only has a few options. So either security kills themselves by doing threat modeling everything themselves, which is unrealistic. Development gets blocked and waits for security um, whenever they need to do a threat model. Or security will have to pick and choose which things to threat model, which means a lot of new features and systems may not get uh, tested. So usually devs will get blocked and security has to pick and choose what to threat model, which isn't very ideal. Um, and ideally the application security team should be focusing on the most important tasks. This might include doing certain threat models, but it doesn't make sense for AppSec to spend time threat modeling a tool that has very limited use and it's internal or it, it, it is very hard to find. So what needs to be done in the situation where you have a small team? So AppSec folks should always focus on the things that are the highest impact to the business. And we shouldn't just threat model for the sake of threat modeling. Okay, so what is self-serve threat modeling? In my utopian world, developers are going to do the vast majority of threat models without even security being part of the process. That means that they're gonna identify the assets, discover the risks, figure out which risks, uh, prioritize those risks and figure out which ones they want to remediate. And they will be able to do this end to end. The security team should focus on training the engineers to get better at threat modeling. Security's role should be training and making sure that they're getting, the engineers are getting better and better and better at threat modeling. Every year, you hopefully you can bring in new and improved training that should be rolled out to make sure that everyone is refreshed and knows how to threat model even better. Um, new, new employees should get all of the training and old employees should get the new trainings that are coming out. So there's constant learning. The goal is actually to make a bunch of mini security engineers throughout the organization. At some point, you'll have an army of mini security engineers, which means that they'll be empowered to find bad things in their systems and they'll want to fix those bad things. They're the ones that discover it. So they have an incentive to actually resolve those things. So um, it just makes things a lot better having this sort of model. Um, and security gets to scale throughout the entire organization. With self-serve threat modeling, it means that uh, security can fit to any size of organization. It doesn't matter if you have 10 engineers or if you have 10,000 engineers, when the engineering team can do the threat models uh, themselves, security will be able to scale. So does it really solve our problems? Well, 
self-serve threat modeling, we consider threat modeling is hard to scale. Well, when everyone is trained to threat model, by definition, we just scale their program. The engineering team can now go and do the vast majority of threat models themselves. Engineering should no longer be blocked by security. Since now that they can do the threat model themselves, they don't have to wait for us. They can just do threat models whenever they need to. And finally, security engineers can be able to focus on the most critical of tasks. It may mean that you focus on just the critical threat models, but it might be that you might be able to focus on other things as well within the organization. So does this mean it's vacation time for us uh, security folks? Well, not just yet. Um, let's really dive into what self-serve threat modeling actually is not. So self-serve threat modeling doesn't mean that the security team no longer is involved with the threat modeling process. It's a program where security can now focus their efforts on being better according to the risks of the organization. So if, they're, if we're concerned with authentication or authorization or PI or PHI, we can just focus our efforts on tackling those sort of things. Self-serve threat modeling also isn't an excuse to blame the developers if they miss something. We're not gonna point fingers at developers if they missed a risk. The program is a team effort and it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we're securing our applications. This also doesn't mean that security is out of a job. Yeah, we know that once uh, like one of our responsibilities is taken care of by someone else, there is gonna be a hundred others to replace uh, that one um, responsibility. So unfortunately, uh, security is always gonna be busy. And this doesn't substitute other important things for security. So uh, not like being able to threat model all the things is great, but we still need to make sure that we continue to do other things to make sure that we have a strong security posture, like security tooling, pen testing, metrics, all that sort of stuff is really important as part of our programs. So. How is this program set up? Well, there are four different phases as part of this program. Um, training phase, which is you actually train the developers. Observation phase is where the engineers are now leading the threat modeling session and the security team is in the room, listening in, coaching and advising them. The review phase, um, which is security team is no longer in the threat modeling sessions. The engineers will actually do the threat models themselves and security will review and make sure everything has been accounted for. And then the security optional phase is actually where security is optional. They can choose to look or not look at it. So um, although I say there's four phases, this is actually, in my opinion, there's only really two phases. It's the training phase. So training is training. Observation phase is really training version two. Review phase is really training version three and security optional phase is the security optional phase. So there's training and security optional. And I'll dive into deeper why I think that it's mostly training. So um, training phase, in order to do self-serve threat modeling, engineers need to learn how to actually threat model. So we had some principles that we came up with uh, when it came to the training itself. We wanna make sure that engineering is motivated to learn. So I'm not too sure if everyone's the same way as me, but I tend to learn when I'm when the material is fun and engaging. You want the engineers to actually want to learn. You want them to show up to these training sessions and be eager to figure out what's going on. So you want to make you have to make those sessions interactive. Have a lot of questions for the group. It shouldn't be one-way communication. Keep the group small so that people are comfortable to actually speak and get involved. It has to be really a group effort when it comes to actually doing these sessions. We also want to say that security is a marathon and not a sprint. Who says you have to do all the trainings at once? This is a multi-year program and you don't have to do 100% of the training in one sitting. So make the training in a way that it's easy to learn and retain the information. Teach engineers things relevant to your business. Threat modeling training should be done in the same vein as threat modeling within your, if you do risk assessments, Train engineers to do risk assessments. If you use Stride to find vulnerabilities, train engineers to do Stride to find vulnerabilities. Incorporate our threat modeling workflow into the training. So again, the goal of the training is to teach people how they can retain and to retain the most information. So with those principles in mind, we decided to spread training over three sessions because I personally don't wanna sit in one course for a day all by myself or with a small group and try understanding all the things that the security team is throwing at, at me. 
So every time I went to any security conference for training, I didn't retain too much information. We pay a lot of money for all of these trainings, which means that the trainer will provide a ton of information to make sure that you get your money's worth. I have to sit through eight or 16 hours of training. I'll probably retain 10% of it on a good day. So these are, fortunately, you're gonna be training employees of the company. And we were able to structure the training in a fashion that would provide the most benefits. Um, I split up the training into three sessions. The first one, I want to introduce the concept of threat modeling and we use Stride internally. So I want to introduce those concepts. The point is to get them familiar with the concepts. And we did a little bit of hands-on practice so that they got to use uh, the concept that they're learning. The second um, session that we set up was to introduce the concept of assets and data classification, which were important to our organization. So there weren't as many new concepts and we did a lot more exercises. They were much, much deeper into the examples. And the third one was to actually do a threat modeling session with a piece of the application that the development team owned. That way they get to get their hands super dirty and they really understand how things work from end to end for threat modeling. So training folks this way made it really easy for them to retain information and actually get something out of these sessions. Again, we don't want to bombard them with information and then throw them into a, a fire and say, do it. We wanna make sure that we train them appropriately and work with them. So some notes about uh, just some of the learnings that we had. Remember, it takes years for us as security professionals to get good at training uh, or at threat modeling. So it's gonna take engineers about the same amount of time to be good at it as well. You need to train them up and make sure it's an easy digestible format for them and try different things and concepts. We started uh, uh, threat, teaching threat modeling with every, every sort of everyday things that people did. So we started with personal safety. People, they really related to that. And we moved from physical safety concepts and we sort of slowly tried to translate them to the threat modeling examples. So try a few different things and see what works really well. And which is why I always love to tell you, fail fast. And I'm gonna repeat myself a lot uh, as a part of it. Um, throw out your training, get feedback, iterate on it. Um, I did that a few times and with my program, I had beta engineering team, they tested it out, they gave me great feedback, I iterated on it, got more feedback, and within a couple of iterations, I got my training 95% of the way there. The sooner you can get it out and get people to give you feedback, it makes it a lot easier. Also, I've never done trainings over Zoom until COVID, so that was an interesting experience. So some of the hints that what I recommend is get people to leave their video on. If it's a small group, they don't mind and they know people in that group and make sure to ask random people questions. It help keep people on their toes and they'll pay more attention. I know that's kind of mean, but uh, I had a lot of fun with it and same with the groups that I did. Um, so what's the observation phase? Like I mentioned, this is really training version two. So you move from learning the theory uh, or to becoming an intern or having some hands-on apprenticeship. So have the engineering team focus on getting all of their appropriate documentations prepared for the threat modeling sessions. We should make sure that they are they take the lead of the threat modeling sessions themselves. And this doesn't take too much extra time from the engineering team. A particular engineer may put an extra half an hour to get the documentation in order. They get the information set up. They set up the meetings, make sure the right people are involved. Um, it, it, it's not that much of an uplift. And the goal of the stage is to make sure that the engineering team is good enough to do threat modeling on their own. Um, and try not to tell the engineers what the vulnerabilities are. Just give them hints and coach them towards it as well. Work with them to figure out the prioritization once they figure out all the vulnerabilities, which ones they should remediate immediately and which ones are we can leave them um, for later. The goal is that every engineer should leave those threat modeling sessions feeling that they've learned something new. And once you start seeing them find all of the critical and high priority vulnerabilities, then you know that they're getting ready to move on to that next stage. So some of the notes that we discovered during the observation phase is again, your job is to coach and get them to a place where they can do threat modeling without you. It's in your best interest to get them to learn. 
I help the engineering teams, especially at the beginning with the documentation. And I use that one-on-one -on -one time to sell threat modeling to the engineer, talk to about how great it would be when security is no longer involved in, as part of the process. And you gotta remember, threat modeling is a team sport. Make sure you have enough people in the conversation and the opinions are diverse enough as well. You wanna build out a robust system. Um, I love to direct message people that are not really talking enough in the threat modeling sessions. Everyone's voice counts. Teach people to call out other people for being quiet. I've learned a lot of times when I call folks out, they come up with amazing threats that I didn't even consider myself. So it's super important to do that. And the more the conversations that we have during the sessions, the better the actual threat model um, threats that we actually discover. I love closing the loop with engineers afterwards. Let them know that they did a bang up job and give them a hearty congratulations. And one thing to note is that some people are just super natural at threat modeling. So literally the first time that we did this, me and a coworker were fairly senior. Um, we had two engineers that, um, that were part of it. So they prepared the documentation. We got into a room, we talked about the vulnerabilities and try to figure out how, um, which ones that we want to deal with. Me and my coworker literally did not provide any additional information as part of that session. The engineers, they discovered all of the vulnerabilities that we had in mind. I was super proud of them. Like it was a, but it was a huge hit on my ego. Like I thought I would be relevant for a little bit longer, but these engineers, they made me feel that I was replaceable, which is ultimately a good thing. Like it means then I could go focus on other things. Okay, the review phase is where we are hoping we're at at our current company. Uh, security is not actively involved in some of the threat models. So there are some teams that are good enough that they're threat modeling on their own. And what we do as security folks, we actually just review the artifacts. So again, the engineers, they put together the documentation, they do the threat model, they'll prioritize the vulnerabilities, and they'll figure out which, uh, which threats that they should remediate immediately and ones which they can leave for later. Um, we will review the artifacts just to make sure that they've uh, discovered all the critical and high vulnerabilities. Um, and in reality, we've been running into these situations quite a few times just at my current company. Like uh, there've been a few situations where the engineer didn't realize that they were not supposed to go ahead and do the entire threat model on their own while well, they did it. And they put to, well, they did it when they put together the threat modeling documentation. So it was still sch scheduled a threat modeling session. Um, and we would get into the, the meetings to discover that they've done all the work. And they came up with a ton of great threats to the system and did a fantastic job. I think in most of those situations, they've covered about 90% of the issues. And uh, a lot of the times they've discovered things that I didn't even consider. So they know their systems really well and they're better at threat modeling their systems than I am. So um, the security optional phase, this is where security utopia is. And this is what we all dream about. Uh, security is truly optional in this space. Pretty much all the features being developed should be threat modeled. Security should continue to be involved in certain situations. I wanna be involved when there's authentication, authorization type of threat models or PAI, PHI is process or anything that touches the internet. So it's really, really critical in, um, areas. Um, and for you, you'll discover the things that are important to you and you want to be uh, as part of it. And I do hope over time we start seeing if we're in this uh, security optional phase, a measurable change in our bug bounty program. And like there'll be fewer and fewer critical and high vulnerabilities that we release. And we have to pay a lot more for those uh, in the, our bug bounty program to attract the great security researchers. And now you can kick up your feet for reals because it's uh, security optional. Okay, so we talked about um, the program in itself. Now I want to sort of talk about some of the good things and bad things that we learned about this program at my current company. So I'm a year into this experiment. What have I learned? Um, we've already talked about some of the things. So we are threat modeling a lot more um, and that we did in the past. The concept of threat modeling is within reach of all developers at my current company. They better understand what needs to be done and what their role is within threat modeling. Reducing that knowledge gap has played a real big part in increasing the frequency of threat modeling engineers and threat modeling, uh, like we've discovered they are so much better than us. They know their system really well. So we come into the threat model, we 
have to learn their system and understand and try finding uh, all these threats while they already know their systems and they know the good and bad parts of it. Now that we taught them how to find vulnerabilities, they're use, able to use that knowledge and create a much more robust system. Trained engineers are better at finding vulnerabilities in their system compared to a trained security engineer. So please note that um, engineers, they don't have to be perfect at that modeling. They don't, they don't need to find all of the things. They just need to find all the critical and high vulnerabilities as part of the system. Our security culture has improved leaps and bounds. Um, I don't know if it's because that they're more interested in security or that they understand security more, um, or they are exposed to what security is really like. It is simply much more interesting to them. So they're reaching out and asking me questions all of the time. I also noted that failing fast is a win. When I started this project on self-serve threat modeling, I, did, I had some analysis paralysis, but as soon as I put out the training and iterated on it, um, it just removed the paralysis. So make sure that you get your feedback quickly from your um, teams. Okay, what are some of the challenges? Um, yeah, I don't think I've mentioned that threat modeling isn't, self-serve threat modeling isn't just rainbows and chocolate chip cookies. There's a lot of challenges to running this program. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is a multi-year program. In our industry, it's a rarity that folks stay on for more than a couple of years. So you need to make sure that whomever is running the program is there for multi-year. Many folks can run this program. This is a very large and key investment from the security team. And you need to make sure that there are some sort of continuity with this program that will last, even if someone were to leave the organization. So um, the Investment makes complete sense, but you have to keep that in mind. It's a very, very large program. Training is hard for a bunch of reasons. Have you ever delivered at someone else's presentation? So I have in my past and it's difficult. So uh, what I always recommend is make sure that you train your trainers and give them the autonomy that they need to modify the training to make it their own. So it have that sense of ownership and it's easier for them to deliver it. Um, and my current company, it's easy for us to really scale the program. We only have 150, 200 engineers, but how do you scale this program to a company that has several thousand developers? Um, I personally was able to train about 80% of the engineers at my company, but scaling this program to a lot larger organization, it won't be a trivial task. So um, it would be very difficult to do instructor-led training, but uh, without that handholding, you might not get the results that you want. So where can you get some additional information? Um, I have a few links up here. Feel free to look at this. This blog has some additional details that I didn't get to into this presentation. It's always a good resource. The whole point of us sharing this information is that I also don't want you to start uh, from scratch. So we have made the training slides all available. Feel free to grab it from our GitHub repo and pull it down. And I've made a self surf threat modeling email address available as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to hit that up. And I want to emphasize that we are a community. We need to work at this together to make all of our software safer. And we don't need to hide all the things that we're doing. We can share some of the things. And this is something that we really want to share. So big thank you again, a big congratulations to OWASP 20th anniversary. If you have questions, um, I'll be available in the Slack channel. But you can hit me up on Twitter at, at Ask Jeevan Singh as well. Thank you all.